Well, good morning, church. Can we give up for a band for leading us in worship this morning? Well, if I've not had the chance to meet you yet, my name is Derek Blewett, and I am one of the pastors on staff here at GM, and I have the very unique privilege to help lead our students and our young adults and do all sorts of other things around here, and I am just so stoked, and I'm so honored to be with you this morning, and I wanted to take a moment and thank Pastor Tim and Carrie for giving me this opportunity, and honestly, just for being the leaders and the friends and the pastors that they are. Um, I don't, I don't know if you guys have realized this, but since we've opened the building, this is like maybe their second break that they've taken in almost six months. They have worked tirelessly to lead this church, to, to pastor us, to care for your families, and we are so blessed to have the Borns as our pastors. We're so blessed to have them in our lives, and I'm just so thankful. Yes, please give it up for them. And so I am very pleased to get to play a part in giving them a break. <laughs> so, um, but uh, today, you know, before I came out here, I just kind of wanted to, a, 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 I felt something in my spirit a little bit. I wanted to say something. Like, I know, like, it's like, some of you might be thinking, like, it's not Tim on stage. And I get it. Like, I'm not Tim. But that doesn't mean that God's word's not going to go forth today. And so... My challenge for you is that I'm used to preaching to students and young adults. And so whatever chaos they're used to bringing to me, I'm, I'm expecting a little bit of conversation this morning. Can we do that today, church? Okay, let's bring it. So uh, this morning, I, am, I have the task of helping to wrap up our series, Something is About to Happen. And this series at its heart has been a, a series of anticipation, of expectation, where we've been looking at the stories of people who God has brought to the brink of miracles. Because in our own church, we are in a moment that is bigger than us. As a church, we have entered into a moment where God has placed us into a situation where we get to have the faith to experience something that most churches will never experience before. And so now we are faced with the task of learning how do we face this moment. And so this morning, before I really get started, I've been kind of stuck on older movies lately. And when I say older movies, I mean like the 2000s. Like, does anyone, <laughs> right? I know, everyone's like, oh, that's not that old. Hey, it is that old at this point, okay? So, but the movie that I've been stuck on lately um, some of the movies I've been stuck on lately are like those comedy movies from the, 20, from the 2000s. I almost called them the 20s, 20 zeros or something. Um, but the, those comedy movies from the 2000s. And there's one that sticks out to me called Click. Does anyone remember Click? Show of hands. I heard a lot of groaning. <laughs> and that's good reason because like, you know, starring Adam Sandler. And so up to that point, if you've ever seen an Adam Sandler movie, you've seen every single one of them. Like, it's, he plays the same character every single time, and he's worth millions now. Like, it, I wish it was that easy. But, like, you look at Happy Gilmore and Billy Madison and the water boy, and he just changes his accent, and it's the same part. But then you get to click, and click, it's like, oh, like, he gets a remote that can, like, control time. How funny is that going to be? Wrong. It's like, oh, like he's going to just uh, you have this existential crisis where he deals with the overwhelming sense and weight of regret as he fast forwards through his entire life and he realizes at the end like, oh, I shouldn't have skipped over my entire life. Like, oh, that's so funny. Yay, roll credits. Like, and that's click in a nutshell, but there's this scene that has stuck with me for so long and there's this moment where Adam Sandler's character, Michael, is talking to Christopher Walken of all people who like gives him this remote and he warns him about the dangers and the consequences of playing with the process. So let's watch this clip together. Have you considered the consequences of the thing you're thinking about doing? Yeah. What are you saying, I shouldn't do it? It's your life. What you do with the remote? It's your decision, Michael. I know, so, I mean, we're talking a couple of months here. I fast forward through it, what am I gonna miss? Uh, 30 arguments and a haircut? Remember the leprechaun? Huh? The one from the cereal ad. They're magically delicious, that guy. Right. He's always chasing the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, but 
when it gets there, at the end of the day, it's just cornflakes. Huh? Mike. Yes? You don't understand the metaphor? I won't do it, all right? I, I think only Christopher Walken could make remember the leprechaun sounds so ominous, right? Like, that's just such a silly thing to say, and yet it sounds so foreboding, like, remember the leprechaun. But I do think there's something to that metaphor. See, Michael wanted to skip the process and get the same results. He, to him, he's just skipping over 30 arguments in a haircut. Like, what's the big deal? But he was missing the point that what he was really skipping over were the moments that made life worth living. He was skipping over the, the, all the parts of life that make it what it truly is just for his own convenience. That he was sacrificing the gold for cornflakes. See, there's, there are processes in, in, in life that we are meant to go through. God has processes for you to grow and to be shaped and to be built to who God has called you to be. And sometimes those processes don't look like how we want them to look. The processes that God wants to bring you through might not feel the way that you want them to feel. They might not sound the way you want them to sound. They might not look the way you want them to look. But if we want God's results in our life, we have to go through God's process. And so this morning, we're going to look at the story of a man named Joshua, who has a very unique story that he got to see multiple somethings happen. He got to lead the people through not just one big miracle, but multiple big miracles. And so we're going to focus on the story of the Battle of Jericho, but before we get to that something, we have to look at the story behind the something. Because if God's ever done something in your life, there's, there's always a story behind the something, isn't there? And so this morning, we're going to start in Joshua chapter 1, when God says to Joshua, verse 9, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. See, the, God gives Joshua two things in this verse. He gives him a command but he also gives them a promise. And it's important to recognize that sometimes God is going to give us commands. It's not a suggestion for Joshua. God is telling him, if you want to be part of the process, if you want to see something happen, you have to be strong. You have to be courageous. It's not optional. And yet sometimes I think that when we hear the commands of God, we like to take them as suggestions. Have you ever thought that God's word maybe could be more than just something to make you feel good? Maybe there's something in his word today that, that you need to hear. That we've been treating as a suggestion when in reality, if you took it for the command that it is, things could change. But see, God doesn't just give us commands as an overlord. He's not bearing down on us as someone just to command us and tell us what to do and boss us around. If God gives you a command, he also will provide a promise to lead you through that command. He will give you the means in which to follow and to fulfill that command. Over and over and over again in the Bible, we see him give these commands out to people and, and he gives them the means to fulfill it. You see, Abraham, he promised Abraham a son but then he called him to sacrifice that son. And he said, no matter what, you will be the father of many nations. When Moses went before Pharaoh, he said, I will go with you. I will give you what you need, but you have to stand before the most powerful man on the earth. See, God is not afraid to pull the God card. But he is gracious enough to give us a promise that we will not be alone. See, God will not command you to do what he isn't capable of doing. He will never command you to do something that he isn't capable of fulfilling in your life. Now, he might call you to do something that you're not strong enough to do. 
He's going to call you to do things that it's not going to make sense to you. But that doesn't mean that he is incapable of doing it. See, because God's promise ultimately is preparation. When God gives you a promise, he is preparing you. He's getting you ready for the process that is coming for the steps in the days ahead. See, have you, have you ever had a situation where you, you walked in to something and you were completely unprepared? Like, I want you to think back to school, like your school days. Maybe for some of you that was a long, long time ago. But when you think back to school, like, have you ever had that moment where you're like, oh, I'm so ready for that test tomorrow. And they're like, no, that test is today. <laughs> Or like, have you ever gone to work and you're like, oh man, like I'm, I'm almost done with that report. Like my boss is going to be so happy. And he's like, yeah, that's due in 15 minutes. Or maybe like you got home, maybe for all my husbands in the room and you like, you, you look over and you see your, your wife, it just has the, those eyes <laughs> just like staring daggers into your soul. And you're like, oh my gosh, I forgot something. And you're like, I don't even know what I forgot yet, but you just know that you forgot something. And so you're waiting for the hammer to fall. See, I think so often, like, I, I know for me, like, there's this, this story that I always look back to. Um, when I was in middle school, I did what a lot of middle schoolers did, and I joined band. Does anyone else play band in middle school? No one wants to admit it. I totally understand that. <laughs> I'm on stage, though, so I have to admit this. So when I was in sixth grade, I was like, well, all my friends are doing it, and so I guess I'm going to go join the band. But I didn't want to just, like, play, like, the flute or something, because... As a, as a sixth grader, I'm like, that's girly. It's an, it's an instrument, though. Like, who cares? But then I was like, oh, I'm going to play something that no one else is playing. And so I picked the bass clarinet. Did anyone else? I had two people in first service that played the bass clarinet. Does anyone else, anyone else ever play the bass clarinet? I'm all alone. Oh, no, I see one hand over there. Atta boy, atta boy. Oh, and back there. Okay, so we got two. We got two. We're good. So I, pl I played the bass clarinet, which I still don't fully believe is a real instrument. Like, I think this is an elaborate prank. So I played this instrument, and when I say played, I meant like I put in sixth grade effort to it, you know? Like I, I tried my hardest, and like every time I was practicing, I was really just staring into nothingness at the time. But at the, like I got to the point where it was a couple days before the first concert that I had to perform in, and then I realized, oh shoot, I'm going to be on stage, and so now everyone's going to know that I can't play this instrument, and so I probably should figure out how to play it. And so I'm like cramming, I'm trying really hard, and I'm so nervous, and I feel so unprepared. And I remember talking to my dad beforehand, I'm like, Dad, like, I can't do this. Like, I'm, they're going to see me, and my life's going to fall apart, and I'm like melting down over this, because this is the biggest thing that could ever happen in my life at this point. And I remember he looked at me, he's like, hey, it's, it's going to be okay. I promise you, I will stay through the entire thing. I'm like... <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> but it was that promise that, that helped me hold on and get ready for that moment. Without that promise, like, I don't even know if I could have gone through with that. But knowing that my dad was going to be there, knowing that I wasn't going to be alone in that moment, it didn't matter what I was going to have to go through. I knew that I could face that moment. See, now imagine the situation Joshua is in. He has to fill the shoes of Moses, the guy that saw God, the guy that received the Ten Commandments, the one that like just casually parted the Red Sea, the one that threw the staff down and called all the plagues down on Egypt. Like, that guy, imagine that's your predecessor, Imagine that's who you have to live up to. It's like you're like the guy that filled in for Michael Jordan after he retired. Like everyone is comparing you to that guy forever. It doesn't matter how good you are. You still have to be compared to the goat. And so that's Joshua. Joshua has to enter into this moment and he has to fill in for Moses. But on top of that, he's never led a nation before. Like how do you prepare to lead a nation of two million refugees He's commanded an army, but he's never led house lives. He's never had to deal with, like, domestic policy and, like, how do you settle disputes between landowners and all these dumb things that an ancient leader would have had to worry about. He just commanded people around. It'd be like if you talked to your employees the same way that you talk to your kids. 
Imagine if you're like, oh, hey, sweetie, it's okay. You can turn in that report whenever you want. Like, that's not going to work. And yet this is the situation that Joshua is in. See, there was no amount of preparation that he could have done that would have made him ready for this moment. There's nothing that he could have done that would have made sure that he was ready to be the leader that he needed to be. He could have gotten the best education. He could have had the, all the mentors in the world. He could have taken every YouTube tutorial. He could have done all of the online courses he found on Instagram. Like he could have had the pedigree. He could have had the network. And it didn't matter because there is no earthly preparation that will ever replace God's promise. See, God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly more than we could ever ask for or imagine. So what could we add on top of that? See, God is prepping Joshua in this moment. He's telling him that days are coming where you're going to need to be strong and you're going to need to be courageous. And so I'm promising you that I will be with you wherever you go. If you just follow me, and if you just trust the process. And so then we see that Joshua leads the people through the first something. So we're going to fast forward from Joshua 1 all the way to Joshua 6, and I'm going to summarize about five chapters of the Bible for you in about 15 seconds, okay? Everyone ready? Just like buckle up really quick. So God tells Joshua, get ready, we're going over the Jordan River. And he's like, okay, boss, we got it. And they get two million people ready, and they cross the river. That's five chapters of the Bible, basically. But there's a lot more to it, and it's deep, and it's beautiful, but we just do not have time for it this morning. But then we get to Joshua chapter 6, because God has done something. He's done the miracle. He's performed something that, like, this generation had never seen before. They'd only heard stories about And so now they get to this moment where they cross the river and they are immediately faced with a fight. Because on the other side of the river is waiting for them a, a city with walls bigger than they could ever imagine. An enemy stronger than they've ever seen before. They cross over and adversity is already waiting for them. And so we're going to talk about how do we face the battle before us. Joshua 6, starting in verse 1, says, Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out, and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. Now, I picture Joshua in this moment, And he's like probably standing across like a plane or something. Like it's cinematic, okay? And he's looking at this city with walls that are so big that he doesn't know what he's going to do. And he's just giving it a good stare. He's doing one of these. He's like trying to measure it up. And he's like... Like have you ever done one of those stares before? Like where something happens and you're just like, I just like, you just have to take it in for a moment. Like you're trying to figure out how to do a project. Or like your teenager says anything and you're just like trying to figure out like what? What? Like literally I do this with fusers all the time. Like they just like say stuff or like it gets even worse when they actually do anything. Like I'm just like looking, I'm like, what what are you thinking right now? (laughs) Like why did you think that was okay? And so I think like it's just that moment where you have to like, your brain has to catch up with what's going on. And so I I picture Joshua in this moment is having this, he's this realization, he's trying to take it all in, and God's sitting there, and he's just like, I've delivered. It's already done. The battle that you think you're about to fight, I've already won it. What's going to come up, it gets good. I got it. And it's really important to realize there that God says, I have delivered. And so I don't know if I have any like English majors or anyone that has the propensity to correct people on their proper use of their, but when he says, I have delivered, that's not present tense, but that's past tense. God's talking in the past tense about a battle Joshua hasn't even fought yet. He's looking at the situation and he says, what you're worried about, I've already finished. 
The problem that you're, you're so stressed out about, I already have the answer. Just follow me. Nothing's changed. Do you have the promise? Just because walls are up now doesn't mean that I'm not God. See, Joshua sees these walls that are bigger than anything that he could overcome. He sees gates that are closed that he could never open. But then he has God saying that he's just like, hey, buddy, I got this. It's okay. But I think there's a lesson for us in this example. See, in life, we will all face a moment where we will have a problem that comes up in our life that we will not have an answer for. There will always be, there will all experience something in this life where the problem will be too big for us. We, we will not have the solution. That it doesn't matter how big our bank account is, it doesn't matter the, the job or the career, the experience that we have, it doesn't matter our accomplishments or who our family is, it won't solve that problem. See, when you face problems like that, they will they'll rip you out of routines. They'll bump you out of the process that God is trying to build you with. And we'll, we'll look at these problems and we'll see things that are bigger than us. But Joshua sees a problem that's smaller than his God. He looks at walls and he doesn't think, how am I going to overcome this? He thinks, what is God going to do next? See, it's all about your perspective. The lens that you see life through affects what you experience. Your perspective will shape and affect how you handle the process that God is taking you through. So what's shaping your perspective this morning? Is your perspective formed more by your faith or by your feelings? Is it, is it what happens to you that kind of dictates how you respond or do you trust that it doesn't matter how big the storm gets? It doesn't matter how good things get. I know that God goes with me wherever I go. Let me put it to you this way. When was the last time you made a decision based solely on faith? I'm not telling you to, to not have logic or not have feelings. Those are God-given and they have a purpose. But if we want to find the gold in life instead of the cornflakes... God's process requires a different perspective. See, because God has a heavenly perspective on the battles that we fight. He sees what's coming and he sees what we face on a day-to-day -day basis, big and small. And he looks at it and he says, I've already delivered. It's already done. He sees these obstacles as opportunities and he sees mountains as miracles in the making. But I think most importantly for you is that he sees something inside of you that I don't think you see in yourself. See, God has this perfect perspective of not just who you are, but who you can be. He doesn't see your past. He doesn't see the wrong decisions you've made. He sees who you, he made you to be. He sees your dreams. He sees what you are capable of. And he knows that he can help you accomplish them. And he knows that you have a potential that's greater than you've settled for. See, but there's something in this world that is trying to distract you. And pull you away and make you see the walls instead of the one who will overcome them. There's an enemy for your soul that's telling you that there is something else that's worth chasing. That that house, those things, that new title, that new relationship, that salary, that ring, that next wife, that next husband, more kids, getting rid of the kids, that is what will truly give you happiness. That is what will truly solve your problems. That's where you'll find true love. Somehow it will convince you that that's the gold at the end of the rainbow. But church, could it be possible that that path is leading us to cornflakes? 
with all of your chasing, because I know that this is a room full of conquerors, with everything that you're chasing, are you content with what you're catching? See, when we face opposition like this, whether it's from someone else, something else, or it's from us, the intensity of the opposition that we face, I think oftentimes can be discouraging. We can look at the battle that we fight and the enemy that we have to overcome, and we could say, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't think I can do this. But with God, the intensity of the opposition that you face is proof of the power of God's promise in your life. That if you're facing a big battle today, it means that you have a big promise ahead of you. And so in those moments where it seems too big, in those moments where the battle seems too fierce, what do you turn to? Where do you go when the enemy seems stacked against you? How do you move forward when the object and the obstacle seems immovable? Well, we see how Joshua responds. The battle plan in this moment, God outlines that he wants Joshua to lead the army to march around the city. One time each day for six days. And then they get to the seventh day. And he's like, then on the seventh day, I want you to march around the city seven times. And then you're going to blow some trumpets and shout, and then the walls are going to come down. And he's just okay with this. And then we see in verse 15, it says, On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and they marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And we go down to verse 20. And it says, When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. Now, I think some, some preachers would be tempted to tell you that what can solve your problems today is to learn how to play the trumpet. That if you, like, if you just go up to work tomorrow and you know, just like, start playing the trumpet at your boss, then like, everything's going to be fine, which I'm not going to do. I think that is a quick way to get you fired. <laughs> but I do think it's important to realize that the closer they got to something happening— that as they got closer in time and proximity to what God was going to do in their life, the intensity of the command grew. What was asked of them got more serious and more severe the closer they got to when God was going to perform a miracle. So have you ever thought, what if Joshua just quit at six days? What if he, because he didn't see any progress. Six times he marches around this city and he doesn't see a brick fall. And so do you ever think like maybe he was just like, well, maybe I misheard God. Maybe this is supposed to be the warm up and then we're supposed to attack a, a different way. And how many times do we get discouraged because we haven't seen any progress in God's promise? How many times do we quit at six? How many times do we get closer and closer to the miracle happening and it gets more intense, it gets even more difficult to take another step and we look and we say, it's just too big. What if we're so close and yet we're missing out on the miracles of God? See, for... Joshua and the Israelites, they had to walk around the walls, they had to play these instruments, and they had to shout in order to see God's miracle come to pass. So this morning, what are you willing to do to see the miracles of God in your life? What are you willing to do to see something happen for your family? What are you willing to do to see something happen for your church? What are you willing to do to see something happen for the next generation? Because those results require resolve. 
And I think resolve is like a, it's like a sexy term, right? It's like, oh yeah, I want to be resilient. And then like you start actually like seeing what it takes to be resilient and you're like, I don't want this. And like anyone that's ever been to the gym understands exactly what I'm talking about, I think. Um, I made the decision, I'm not going to say it's a good decision yet, but I made the decision a couple months ago to start working out um, with most of the other guys on staff. Um, we go to a gym. Uh, it's not like golds or something, okay? It's not like we're like showing up and we're like benching for 20 minutes and then sitting around on our phones for three hours. It's like we go and it's really hard. I struggle to explain this to first service. Um, it's not CrossFit, okay? Uh, and I'm not going to make fun of anybody for doing CrossFit. It's just, I think it's important to note that the characteristics of Colts and CrossFit are a little too close for comfort. I just, I'm just saying, okay, examine how you spend your time. But I would say it's CrossFit adjacent, I guess. I don't know. That's what our gym, the gym owner said, that it's kind of CrossFit adjacent. I'm like, I don't, I want to go less now, but... I will say that when we're doing these workouts, it's like all these weird combinations of like, hey, I want you to stand on this pad, and then you're going to take this bar that looks like a yoke that an oxen would wear, and we're going to put like 500 pounds on it, and then you're just going to start bending over. And I'm like, why? <laughs> like, what muscle is this working out? And they'll just tell us to shut up and just keep doing it. But there's, we have this group chat that we always play like a polite version of chicken in, where we're all like kind of texting back and forth and we're talking about like what class are we going to go to tomorrow and then like someone is always like man wouldn't it be crazy if we just like didn't go like that would be wild right like no one would ever do that we're all just like virtually just like staring at each other like seeing who's gonna be the person to back out first so we can all be like oh well like I mean I guess we don't we can't go because not all of us can go like the one person's like I have an appointment so like I can't go and they're like oh darn it me too <laughs> like but then, we'll, like, generally, we, we're pretty good about going, and so we end up having more, uh, going more often than not, and there's always this moment, like, we're, like, in the middle of dying, it feels like, and we're, like, laying there, and we're looking at each other, and we just have this moment where it's like, why are we doing this? Like, what is this worth? Is this working? Because it's been months and it's like, I feel like we feel like we're seeing results finally. But for those first like six, eight weeks, it's like, I don't know if this is working. But I know it's because we want the results. We want the payoff. We want to be healthy. We want to be able to serve the kingdom for 40, 50, 60 more years. We want to be healthy at doing this. But those results require the resolve to keep going. We have to have a level of grit that is willing to hold on when it just doesn't feel good anymore. And I think grit is a dying art and skill in our world today. I think we're, we're allowing ourselves to be told it's okay to quit on things in life. It's okay to quit on that dream. It's okay to quit on your friends. It's okay to quit on your family. It's okay to quit on your marriages just because it's not convenient for you anymore. But that's not what God says. Tell me the accomplishments and the accolades you've accomplished in this life without grit. You didn't build that business that you have without that grit, did you? You didn't accomplish those things without perseverance. You, didn't, you don't have the career and the success and the family that you have without having grit. There's no gain in this world that's worth getting without it. And it's a grit that refuses to give in. It's a grit that gets results. And the same thing applies for our spiritual lives. Sometimes, if you want to see God's results in your life, it's going to take more than one Sunday. It's going to take more than one sermon. It's going to take more than opening up your Bible one time. It's going to take more than showing up to life group one time to find community for your family. It's going to take more than one Wednesday night for your students to find hope. It's going to take more than one weekend or one experience for you to find the purpose that God has for you. And yet, how many times do we give up after one?
Church, I believe in the perseverance of following after God's process because my life is a living testimony to it. I, I was born, I was born with a disease that when I found out in elementary school, I was told that I was going to kill me one day. So my entire life, basically, I had been raised with this clock over my head, knowing that one day there was going to be something that I had no control over, that I didn't do anything to deserve, there was no punishment, and there was no hope. A disease that ended up killing my mom. And so for 30 years, I prayed. I had all the faith in the world. I served God, I went to church, I tithed, I did all the things, and I didn't see any progress for 30 years. I cried my tears of hopelessness knowing that the only answer that I had could be found in Jesus, and yet I didn't see any answers for over 30 years until finally one day he cured me of that disease. He gave me freedom that I didn't deserve. And I don't share that story to say, look at how heroic I am. Look at the faith that I have. I share that story to tell you that I'm not special. That my story is not special. That what God has done in my life, he could do in yours if you would have the perseverance to hold on and follow his process. Because his process pays off every time. God is not a God of failure. He is not a God of giving up. He is a God that will provide hope and freedom and love and truth in your life if you would just hold on. See, Hebrews 10.36 says you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. There's a process that process requires perseverance. If you want change in your life, you have to change. You have to be willing to trust the process that God has for you. You have to be willing to persevere through the process until you see his promise come to pass. Because I promise you that the battles that you're facing right now, however big it may be, however hopeless it may feel, the battle before you is nothing compared to the God that's inside of you. See, God has a story that he wants to tell through you, through your story, through what you've gone through. No matter how normal or insignificant or broken it may seem, he has a story that he wants to bring redemption through. But are you willing to play your part to see it come to pass? Church, let's have the resolve to hold on for God's results this year. Let this be the year of favor, not just for this church, but for your family as well. Let's stop falling for the same process that keeps failing us. Let's stop settling for the cornflakes that this world keeps offering us. And let's trust that if God is promising us gold, then we're going to hold on. If God is promising us gold, then we're going to fight for it. That if God is promising us gold, then we're going to persevere until it comes to pass. Let me pray for you. God, I ask in the name of Jesus for life change. God, I know that something is about to happen in this room today. Not just in our church, not just in a abstract, metaphorical way. I believe that you want to do something in this room today. I believe you want to change a life. I believe you want to change a marriage. I, want, I believe you want to change a future. I believe you want to change someone's outcome. And so I pray that we would have the courage and the resolve to hold on until we saw your results. Knowing that your process may be difficult, but it's the only thing worth following that your path may ask us of everything. It may ask us to sacrifice our time. 
It may ask us to be inconvenienced. It may ask us even to sacrifice our money in obedience to what you have called us to do. But it's worth it. God, I pray that we would be a church that tells stories. That we would encourage each other. That we would remind ourselves of everything that you've already accomplished in this room. And everything that you're waiting to bring to pass. God, I pray that that story starts today. In your name, amen.